Christian for over 28 years talking about things that matter with people who care. Production of McQuistian is made possible in part by individual viewers, supporters of the Foundation for Responsible Television, the University of Texas at Dallas, creating the future. Hello, I'm Dennis McQuistian, and we're going to put perspective on Hong Kong and in particular, the relationship between Hong Kong and Beijing. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Jim Falk. He's the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And he's going to tell us about some very special people he's interviewed in the last few days. And in the last part of the program, uh, he and I will bring in Cynthia Watson. So, Jim, take it away. Thanks so much, Dennis. And, you know, it really is quite amazing when you think about what's happened this summer. Over the last few weeks, the relations between China and the United States have continued to, to deteriorate to the point where some observers are even going so far as to speculate that our diplomatic relations, which were established way back in 1979, are at risk of being severed. The July 22nd order by the United States that China close its consulate general in Houston was a clear warning that business would no longer be the same. And as you well know, for the last 23 years, China and Hong Kong had an understanding that uh, they would have a, Hong Kong would have a high degree of autonomy under what was commonly described as one country, two systems. And that was supposed to last for 50 years. But on June 30th, the Communist Party of China changed the rules by invoking that national security law that immediately reduced political freedoms that had been in place ever since the handover by Hong Kong, uh, of Hong Kong by Britain to China in 1997. So today, these protests are continuing, and recent steps by China, the United States, the United Kingdom, demonstrate that the Hong Kong we once knew will be forever changed. And so joining us today are really four just outstanding experts. Uh, Dr. Richard Haas, he is the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's the author or editor of 14 books, including his most recent, The World, A Brief Introduction. Dr. Christian Bros, he's the author of an important and very timely study of U.S. military preparedness. It's called The Kill Chain, Defending America and the Future High-Tech Warfare, and examines very closely U.S. and China strategy and their military assets. From 2015 to 2018, Chris served as staff director of the Senate Armed Services uh, Committee, and prior to that, Dennis, he was the late Senator John McCain, senior policy advisor. Gordon Chang, someone who's been on the show uh, many times before, he's a widely recognized political commentator on China and uh, who spent much of his career practicing law in Shanghai and Hong Kong. And he too has a new book. He's the author of The Great U.S.-China Tech Warfare. And you often see him on Fox News where he's a contributor. Look, our relationship is uh, bad and getting worse. And this is a potential lose-lose situation. It'd be bad for the United States. It'd be bad for China. Now, this is the defining international relationship of this era of history. And if the, situ if the relationship becomes a Cold War, if it even worse than that becomes a hot war, tremendous direct and indirect cost. Uh, I'm a realist, I don't expect the relationship to become close. The real challenge is can you carve out selected areas of limited cooperation against a backdrop or in a context where obviously you disagree and compete? I think particularly as we look at events in Hong Kong and how um, the Chinese Communist Party is addressing uh, you know, what they see as, you know, kind of uh, popular dissent um, among people in Hong Kong, you know, not wanting to live under the authoritarian rule of Beijing. Um, you know, the, the clear question arises of, you know, what China, what mainland China, what, uh, the, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party does vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong is going to be somewhat of a bellwether for, you know, how they're going to think about and approach uh, Taiwan. Um, so I think this is something that we in the United States need to be much more focused on, um, both in terms of, you know, the potential for conflict. China has ended the one country, two systems formula that was supposed to apply until 2047 because Hong Kong was promised 50 years of a high degree of autonomy. 
Now, this national security law, which was passed in Beijing, bypassed the Hong Kong Legislative Council because in Hong Kong, this type of legislation is extremely unpopular. Um, what Beijing has been doing in this law is essentially taking over Hong Kong. And people say, and I think there is some justification to it, that this is the end of law itself because Beijing can basically do whatever it wants under this law. So uh, it is going to have uh, implications. We, of course, don't know what they'll be. We know that the pro-democracy forces at least have been intimidated, but there were demonstrations on July 1st, and that shows that uh, at least some of the kids are going to continue to fight. But also, just stepping back and looking at this, you know, China probably can take full control of Hong Kong. But what it will do, it'll destroy Hong Kong as a global financial center. Yes, it will remain a financial center for China, like Shenzhen or Shanghai, but it won't be the vibrant cosmopolitan city that we all know today. Well, Jim, you and I are sitting here with Cynthia Watson, and Cynthia Watson is the Dean of Faculty and Academic Affairs at the National War College in uh, DC, and she's also a national uh, committee member of the US-China Relations Organization. And, and, you know, Cynthia, you and I spent some time in China I guess about 14 years ago, all things. Mm -hmm. And we were in Hong Kong, but I don't think either of us figured out that what's happened in Hong Kong on particularly July 1st of 2020 was actually going to take place. So give that viewer of ours just a little bit of history going back to 1997 and the mm -hmm. British turnover to uh, China and how that worked. Thank you very much, uh, Jim and Dennis. It's, it's uh, a pleasure to be with you today. I have to start by saying everything I'm about to say is my personal analysis and shouldn't be construed as US government policy because it is just personal. The irony of the passing of the national security law uh, fully 23 years to the day relinquished uh, Hong Kong back to China is one that was not lost on many people. The agreement in 1997 was that Hong Kong would have a separate uh, administrative status under China for fully 50 years. I'm not sure anyone expected it to merely be 23 years, but we certainly saw with the passing of this law, a very different environment evolve in Hong Kong. Cynthia, since that uh, changeover in 1997, things haven't always been smooth. In fact, uh, if you would bring us up to date about really what's happened in the last five or six years that brought us to where we are right now. Hong Kong has always been in a tough position, Dennis. It's a very expensive city. It's a finite amount of land. It's, it's a hard place in some ways to live, even though it's such a beautiful place. And beginning about six years ago, the students in Hong Kong became increasingly restless with the way that they felt Beijing was already violating the 50-year agreement. So we had uh, a number of protests. Those protests lasted for a fair amount of time, but it was really last year, just over a year ago, when students who felt that they didn't have much of an economic future living in this extraordinarily expensive small place which keeps prices up, burst into Again, a lot of protests, and those protests have continued over the last year. So as Beijing looked at this, I think what most analysts believe is that they decided they simply were not willing to tolerate these protests any longer. This is so interesting because so often when you see protests like this, you can at first think, well, maybe it's a movement towards democracy, but you've just suggested it really was driven by the economy. I think initially it was driven by the economy. Clearly, young people around the world tend to be very idealistic in many cases and would like to have absolutely as many freedoms as they can accomplish or, or get in a society. What started the concerns about six years ago did relate to an, an encroaching way that Beijing was more and more pressuring 
the government in Hong Kong to adhere to Beijing's desires. But I think the initial push for the protests in the last several years has really been economic. It's, it's hard for us to recognize how the, the sense of frustration for someone living in Hong Kong as prices continue to escalate and they do not see nearly as many opportunities as they saw in the past has affected young people. Well, I think for a number of years, whenever you would look in The Economist and other publications, the price of real estate and apartments were always the most expensive in Hong Kong. When, when you look at what's happened in 2020 or even going back to these protests late last year, was there one event that really sparked it? I don't think, I think we tend to look for that, but I think what we saw was an accumulation of frustrations. I think that what we saw was, again, this generational shift. People who increasingly wondered whether, just like some of the protests we've seen in the United States over the last several months, people who wondered whether the system was rigged against them and a feeling that they had to make sure Beijing understood that this is the message they were receiving. I think also there was clearly an intent on Beijing's part to send a message to Taiwan that if Taiwan, which is in a different status, but clearly is a, an an entity that Beijing worries a great deal about. If Taiwan were to take similar steps to protest Beijing's behavior more directly, that, that China would react to that. Uh, Cynthia, the uh, event, well, one of the events that happened last year was this so-called extradition issue. And the mm -hmm. other part mm -hmm. of it was, I think the protesters had four or five demands and including, I think, maybe more representation than whatever their legislative process right. is. And then, of course, there were always a few who held up signs that say democracy or independence, right. et cetera. Right. Now, okay. how big uh, an issue in terms of what China did with this national security law is the fact that China now may see the U.S. as weaker because of trade issues, because of COVID-19, because of uh, our let's just say, inability to focus on what's really going on there. Clearly, we are distracted, and, and many states around the world recognize that. But I don't think what happened in Hong Kong is aimed at the United States. I think it is aimed at the people who live in that entity. And I think that the extradition issue that you mentioned highlights a growing sense of anxiety, number one, that Beijing would not adhere to the 50-year agreement that it made with Britain, but also this it, it recognized this growing sense that China is evidencing of it having a global reach beyond its borders. And the idea that extradition had to respond to Beijing's needs, not necessarily the needs of the people of Hong Kong. And therefore, the idea that you would worry about representat uh, representation on the LegCo was not something that Beijing was ever going to be uh, particularly open to. They've shown no evidence of that, I would argue, over the years, unless you consider them having taken 23 years before they passed a step quite like this. So how widespread were the protests? Because you mentioned students several times, but did you right. see other parts of the population? And, and who was funding that? Uh, I don't think it was quite as widely protested as what we might have expected uh, based on the media reports that we saw. I have not been to Hong Kong during this period, but I will note that when I saw a colleague at a meeting in Taipei back in November, he has lived in, uh, he's a Frenchman who's lived in Hong Kong for a couple of decades now. He made the point that he rarely, if ever, saw a protester. They tended to be concentrated only in the city center where they would attract a lot of attention. But for much of the population, older people, 
uh, business people. This was more of an annoyance than it was anything else. Uh, the sources of funding were multiple. There are certainly foreigners that have been supportive of this. This is one of the claims that Beijing, frankly, has made, that this is something that might have been actually funded by the United States. But I think it was more broadly uh, groups outside of China, some of whom are what's called the Chinese diaspora, some of whom are simply others within Asia who are increasingly nervous about Beijing's growing posture in the region. Cynthia, our government, uh, particularly the Secretary of State, and mm -hmm. obviously the Congress now has passed a law as well in response to what's happened. So we are being, let's just say, critical of what uh, Beijing is doing. And so it's not only that now, we've got technology companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, to name mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. uh, are concerned about uh, dealing with the Hong Kong authorities. I mean, this, this whole thing from a geopolitical standpoint seems to be sort of uh, tension filled. Would that be a fair statement? Oh, it's definitely tension filled, Dennis. I think what you're seeing is an increasing recognition that on the technology side, Beijing has different aspirations than what we would call the Western consensus. Beijing is far more willing to control information, to use technology to the state's ends than we are in the United States or in Western Europe, where we tend to think of things in much more of a free market approach. But what I think is also interesting is some of the uh, technology that's more towards social platforms has to make a choice. Those are platforms that by and large cannot operate in the same way inside the mainland, inside what's called the Great Firewall as they can in Hong Kong, but then they've got to make a choice. Do they think that over the long term, having better relations with Beijing and therefore cutting back on anything that could upset Beijing about their behavior in Hong Kong has to be measured against the possibility of irritating the United States. And as you rightly point out, the U.S. Congress has been very vocal as Secretary of State Pompeo has been. And I think that it's this uh, tension that we're only going to see increase as states, as companies, as various groups feel that they are being forced to make a choice between what could broadly be called the Beijing approach and the Western approach. And I guess it, of course, can escalate because we could block some of the Chinese apps, couldn't we? We, we could, and we already are doing that. There has long been a view in China that the United States seeks to continue what was a century of humiliation in their rhetoric, the idea of keeping China in a subservient position, not allowing it to rise to its natural role in the world. And some of the moves that we've seen in the United States, discussions about Huawei, pressure on some of our allies not to use Huawei products, uh, the visa issues that have come up about students coming from China to the United States as another way to potentially control technology. Just recently, sec uh, the uh, director of the FBI gave testimony uh, or excuse me, gave a uh, set of remarks at the Hudson Institute in Washington, where he talked about Chinese spying and the way that that has been manifested in um, various approaches that look like they are more part of civil society. So China, I think, would say that they are already seeing the United States attempt to curtail some of the Chinese uh, role in the West whether it's just because of the Hong Kong issue or more broadly as part of this idea that, that they need to keep China under control. Let's step back for a moment and give us our viewers a sense of how Hong Kong has been administered. There's a chief executive officer, Correct. not elected. Who do right. the police report to? How does it work? 
Uh, the police in Hong Kong are loosely tied to Beijing. They are, they are part of China now. Ch uh, Hong Kong's status is that of a special administrative region, a SAR. And that means that there are now People's Liberation Army troops that are garrisoned in Hong Kong. They frankly don't come out very often, but they are there. Uh, the police, the uh, legislative council, which does have a democratic base, but we've seen more and more pressure on the anti-Beijing parties to stop them from speaking out and potentially egging on the students. All of these steps are what I said earlier, have been this gradual pressure that I think led to the protests over the last couple of years, last year and a half, as the, what appeared to be independent organizations increasingly were put into a position they had to hew to Beijing's demands. So Dan has touched on the increasing tension between the United States and China and what's yeah. happening in the, in, in the capital now. The United States is famous for invoking, implementing sanctions. What are yes. some of the measures that we might take that won't really hurt who we don't want to hurt, I suspect, the residents of Hong Kong? It's, it's hard to be really clear on how that will work because one of the things that differs between Chinese foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy is that China is always fixated on whatever its ultimate goal is. And they will take steps that they think merit use because the goal in their mind is worth achieving. And I think that this is, again, tied to any indication that China would be confronted by chaos through more and more protests, or worse from Beijing's perspective, any indication that the people in Taiwan would interpret weakness on China's part in dealing with these protests in Hong Kong as an indicator that it might be a time when Taiwan could take on um, a more formal position on independence. I think Beijing is very worried about that, and I think Beijing will react very aggressively to anything that it thinks in its relationship with Hong Kong can lead to this chaos. And so in many ways, the US part of it just becomes a tit for tat with the United States on questions like the visas or on technology. But I'm not certain that we have nearly as, mon as much leverage as we would like to believe we have. We have um, uh, an acknowledgement, obviously, that it is the Chinese Communist Party, which is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. And yet this particular president um, has gone beyond what the presidents before him have done. Give that viewer just a sense of that particular individual, President Xi Jinping, and what he has done and how that may affect what's happening in Hong Kong and may affect the future of Chinese and U.S. relations. Xi Jinping took power in November of 2012. And he has been, as I indicated a minute ago, far more aggressive in using all instruments available to China to make their point. Uh, as an example, a couple of years ago when they were unhappy with something that South Korea was doing, they used tourism as an instrument of statecraft. That sounds pretty odd to the United States, but it, it goes to the belief that achieving your objectives is what has to be done for China to, to be seen in the international community as strong. What I find very ironic is China increasingly sees itself as needing to project strength overseas at the same time that they appear to be quite fearful of their own population. And actually a different way you could look at Hong Kong is that they are fearful of what these you know, 16 to 24 year olds are doing in a city where those kids don't have a whole lot of power. But that again, the, the idea that you would destabilize 
anything that looks like it's important for China's future is something that the Communist Party or, or the ruling party, we should call it, because it's not communist in a traditional sense, uh, but the, that party is not willing to tolerate anything that can undermine their rule. We just have a little bit of time left, but I wonder how the United Kingdom is reacting to this since the original agreement on reversion was yeah. with them. I think that there's a lot of buyer's remorse in the UK. I think there's a feeling not just that they signed this agreement, they wish they hadn't. Everyone should remember that Hong Kong under uh, agreements signed in the 19th century, Hong Kong was going to be British in perpetuity. Uh, but I think beyond that, um, several years ago, I think it was about 2015, Britain seemed to get very close to Xi Jinping. Uh, he made a state visit. There were a lot of financial agreements signed and he got a dinner with the queen and the whole song and dance. And now there are a lot of people in the UK asking, has, has China become too dominant in our foreign relations and have we been sold a bill of goods? And I think that that is very hard for a country that did hold that British crown colony for 150 years. Cynthia, uh, if we wrap up the portion here on Hong Kong, is there anything that Jim and I haven't asked you that you think that viewer needs to know about the Hong Kong situation? No, I would just say we need to keep watching. It is, as we found out with the coronavirus experience over the last six months, uh, foreign policy does not follow an absolute trajectory that we can be certain of. Something could reverse this, but I don't find too many factors that would seem likely to do that. So I think what we're gonna see is increasing interest in whether people stay or whether they feel that they have to leave. And that will be indicative of the future of the, of the, of the SAR. A lot for us to watch over the next few months. Uh. Thank you for following us on LinkedIn. And you know, you can always watch us on YouTube or on mcquistontv.com. And again, thank you for joining us as we provide perspectives on things that matter with people who care. For more information, call 214-750-5157 or email Nikki N at NikkiMcQuestion.com. Visit our website at www.mcquestiontv.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at www.twitter.com slash TV or download McQuestion TV video podcast on iTunes. 